So what exactly is this satellite doing right now? Well, thank you for having me back, Emily. So you know, we are so excited to have our edge AI technology in the satellite bus of a Satellogic NewSat satellite. And what this allows us to do is quickly move AI models right next to the satellite's camera itself. So you think about the pictures we're taking, the video that you can get from space, these are massive files. And it takes so long to bring that data down to Earth. And it really introduces tremendous latency in terms of how long it takes you to leverage insights that are happening in the real world, uh, given that downlink delay. By moving the AI inferencing to space, you can do that in seconds and you can get the information down to Earth in less than a minute. Uh, and that is a fundamental game changer. So can you share some examples of what will improve because you have this capability? When we move, so commercial space has exploded over the last decade now, we are drowning in collection. But if you think about it from say, for example, a military commander's perspective, they're not interested in saying, when can I get the next picture over this region, perhaps a region in the Ukraine or Russia. You're, they want to know how many tanks are there, how many transport elector, erector launchers are there. They have mission questions and how often can I revisit that? I need that information every hour. And with this capability, you can now reduce all that latency to provide real-time insights that provide real deterrence, as we've seen in the conflict in Ukraine, and, and real insight into what's happening in the world. Now, uh, the war on Ukraine has sparked backlash against Russia's continued dominance in space, and you've got a lot of companies looking for partners as a result. Has Palantir seen any new business because of that? We have really mobilized our entire company against the invasion in Ukraine and the consequences of that. I think in many ways, we believe this situation was foreseeable. And you know, at the time of our listing, we talked quite publicly about how we would not work with the Russian government and actually with Russian companies, given the overall context there. But now our software is being used to power refugee operations from Romania, Poland, Lithuania, across all of Europe. I've talked before about how supply chain is really a software problem. And our software here is helping, just like we do with the World Food Program, it's helping match all of the, the goods that are coming in, the beds that are available, everything that's coming from the hands of the donors to the hands of the refugees and those who need it, and doing that as efficiently and effectively as possible, given the incredible scale, millions and millions of refugees that need help in this moment. Similarly, we are helping commercial companies with their supply chains. There are a lot of automotive parts that are made in Ukraine. We've helped BMW ensure the continuity of their Munich facilities and production plans by dyna dynamically changing their production plans to respond to the changing supply chain shocks that are, okay. that are occurring. And of course, most obviously, we have been deeply involved in helping with the military response, not just in the US, but across European nations who are on a fundamentally different footing from a defense and security posture since the invasion. How are you helping them? We're helping them uh, gain insight into what's happening on the ground. A lot of that is coming from space. A lot of that's coming from reports that are happening through different fused information sources. There's a lot that's happening on social media right now that gives you fundamental insight and, and helping drive coordination around the logistics. Uh, and a lot of that plays into refugee operations. How many folks are we expecting? How do we plan for the capacity of the folks that we need to, to provide housing for it, bedding for it. There are an enormous number of orphans, I'm sad to say, that, that we're helping uh, provide housing and shelter for as they come across the border. Now, you have talked about supply chain trends in the past, food shortages, and I'm curious, given your unique view and all of the data that Palantir has, you know, how is the supply chain crisis at this moment? Is it easing? And especially when it comes to food, which in so many parts of the world, we're short on. Yeah, I, I wish I could say it was easing. I think it's actually getting worse right now. Uh, when I look at what's happening with inflation, we had inflationary pressure from COVID. We had inflationary pressure from, from Ukraine. But now it, it's, it's kind of, it's, you know, we have inflationary pressure as it relates to energy, as it relates to food. And what we're seeing is that companies that have a granular transaction level enterprise profitability data asset are the ones that are going to thrive here. They have a better ability to do revenue management. They have a better ability to uh, find substitutes in their supply chain and, and be more competitive and offer the lowest price to their customers going forward. And those that don't are really struggling to understand what this means, not only for their own profitability, but how they should be reacting and pricing in the market. So I, th I think the greater challenges lie ahead of us here for the commercial world. What do you think is going to happen with the markets, Sham? I mean, Palantir shares, you know, along with the rest of big tech have taken a nosedive since the first part of the year, though Palantir actually, since the, the war started, 
actually trending upwards? We had a very strong 2021. We did 41% revenue growth with 28% adjusted free cash flow. In this environment, investors are very excited to see that combination of strong revenue growth and profitability in cash on a cash generation basis. Uh, the U.S. commercial business doubled for the second year in a row. Uh, the government business grew 47% year over year. So I think you know we came out of our Q4, Q3 earnings call really thinking, wow, we're so excited about the business. It's clear from the feedback that investors are mixed. They don't quite see everything we're seeing. We went into the, to the end of year call, the Q4 call, really breaking a lot of detailed cohorts out, which allowed investors to see what we were seeing in the business and why we were so excited about the performance of, of the key growth areas, U.S. commercial, right. government business. And I think the market's reacting to that.